Well, welcome um, to another uh, in the series of, of the pain and pleasure of living a life on purpose. Today, my guest is Ian Benson, and I'm very privileged to having known Ian for about 10 years, um, when, just after I moved to New Zealand. And um, I was kind of like a thorn in his side because I wanted to know what he knew and see what I could, how I could involve myself in his life. And I'm very lucky that he only lives 10 kilometers up the road. But having said that, because he spends a third of his time in Europe, um, I tend to be the taxi to and from the airport and we're about to take off again, aren't you, Ian? No, absolutely. So thanks, Philippa, for inviting me to um, see if I can shed a little bit of light on, on what might be the, the purpose of, of um, my life and how that applies to, yeah. How we can help other people. Yeah. So, I mean, as a brief introduction from um, the work that I've done with you and things and what I know, it's really about connecting and building relationships with ourselves as humans but you use horses um as facilitators would you like to enlighten us a bit more as to the extent of your work no oh, absolutely it's for probably the last 25 over 25 years i've been been working with horses and horses in conjunction with people and it really began to fascinate me how horses well, my horses could build relationships with complete strangers in a very short space of time mm -hmm. and, um, it's it was just a fascinating journey to follow and to see what that was about how that how that actually worked and so, in the process of doing that I learned a lot about myself uh -huh. so how did you tap into um, knowing that your horses were building a relationship with strangers so, well what I noticed was I could put 10 different people on one horse and it was right. like 10 different horses and even if those 10 people had the perfect technique of horse riding or handling horses, it was still 10 different horses. So I really began to question what was going on there. I came to a conclusion very early on was that everybody rode or handled a horse exactly how they lived their life. Ah, so, it was an, uh, so that was about 25 years ago you discovered um, it? It was probably about 15 years ago I came to that conclusion. And then I've spent the last 15 years working out how that, trying, how that works, how, how the whole thing fits together. And it's, it's a fascinating journey with that. The, what I find is that the more I learn, the less I know. And every, every answer comes with a few more questions. <laughs> yes, it's a bit like life, isn't it? The more you know, the, the, the more you discover you don't know. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's, it's like what I don't know now is bigger than it ever was. <laughs> it keeps me moving forward and, and, and striving to do it. So but what do you know? What do I know? I know what have you discovered about yourself in this journey? Oh, well, I, 35 years ago, I went farming so that I didn't have to have anything to do with people. Really? But, absolutely. And um, so it's, it was my escape. From people I didn't like the judgment of people and it felt a lot safer for me to be with animals can I can I ask you as to why what brought you to that place oh, I think just growing up and not feeling um, good about myself for right reason yeah yeah but there was one a passion that I had as a child and that was for horses right. and I, never, I never got one I was never allowed one and um, so it wasn't until I was, oh, in my mid to late 20s that a friend took me for a horse ride. Yeah. I absolutely hated it. Really? No, oh, totally. Totally hated it. So how did the horse behave? <laughs> Knowing what you know now, what would you say that horse was telling you then? It's like, get a life. <laughs> really? <laughs> it was about becoming confident. And, and it wasn't, wasn't until probably um, 20 years later that... I realized why I hated that so much. And it's like when I was a kid, I could sit on horse and, and just do stuff, but didn't have any lessons or anything like that, but there was no fear. But as I got older, um, I had more responsibility. And so at that stage, when I went did that riding, I had a farm and I had you know a mortgage with the bank and, and there was this responsibility and there's this little voice in the back of the mind going, what if something happens to you? Right. What happened then? And, um, yeah, so really that created a, a tension in my mind 
which created a tension in my body, yep. which the horse picks up on. It didn't misbehave or anything like that, but it was, I felt out of, totally out of my comfort zone. Right. Yeah. But the idea that came from that and the seed that was planted was, you can do this on your property. And and two what? years later. Sorry? Did you then, did. or did it, was it a process to get where you are now? It, well, well, two years later, it was, I was kind of thinking about it. And, and two years later, I was talking to my neighbor about the up and coming farming season. And this voice said, and I'm going to buy some horses. And it was even I looked around to see who said that. <laughs> <laughs> it, but it came out of my mouth. Right. And um, it was kind of, the, that's when the decision was made to do it. Right. It was like one of those little defining moments. Well, and that how long part, ago was that? Pardon? How long ago was that? That was um, a little over 25 years ago. Wow. Wow. And, um, it was, it was one of those things that um, that evening the telephone rang and someone said, um, I hear you're starting up a horse riding business. I've got a horse here for you. Come and get it. Really? That quickly? That quickly. And it just, yeah, it, it really flew along from that point. Wow. So it, was, it, was, it was really, it was really a defining moment. And serendipitous, eh? Yeah. Or not? Yeah. Then what came up, like, here's me owning horses, setting up a horse riding business without ever owning a horse in my life. And not knowing really what you were going to do with them. Oh, yeah, I was, I was going to take people trail riding, trekking. Right. That was the plan. Yeah. And it, it remained the plan. And the prospect of it, once I had that first horse, I don't know what frightened me more, the thought of dealing with people. <laughs> and the thought of dealing with horses. Quite you just point to the horse. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I did find that the horses were the easy part. Yeah. Yeah, and um, it was, it, it was a, definitely a steep learning curve. Yeah. And, what um, aspect of it was steep? Oh, just learning about, learning about horses initially mm -hmm. and sort of understanding them a little bit more. So did you, um, when you had these horses, did you immediately start your trekking business or did you kind of slowly move into it? Six months later, I opened for business. I'd accumulated 10 or 12 horses. That many? <laughs> just jumping right into the deep end. Right. Yeah. Sounds just yeah. like you, actually, as I know you. <laughs> so, yeah, away, away we went. Anyway, after about oh, two, two or three months of being in business, I was in, invited to take someone's place in a, in a, a problem horse workshop. Right. And it was really amazing. This guy, little Australian guy by the name of Merv Kildy, was was handling horses, and th and they were problem horses. I mean, they were big problem horses. And um, within a very short space of time, they acquired little lambs. And that kind of there was a little voice in the back of my head that said, "You better watch what this guy does because you're going to be doing this again." Wow. Something. Yeah. Anyway, I think there were one or two things that I picked up from that and that I could do and the rest of it I put in the too hard basket. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and this guy went back to Australia at the end. There was no books or videos or even equipment. And, and so with that, what I realized right at the beginning, at the end of that workshop, is my horse is my teacher. Right. And so it was really important to begin to listen to the horse and, and understand the horse. And so, um, and a year later, the, this guy came back to New Zealand. I was able to do another three days of learning with him. Mm -hmm. And I actually watched him this time instead of standing there with my mouth open, looking at the changes in the horses. Right. Yeah. And what did you discover from him? It, well, it was, he was, he was an older guy and he really didn't have the words to describe what was going on. He, he, he spoke in riddles, really. Just a few words, you know, observe, remember, compare. Right. Timing, balance. Yeah. And so over the years, I started to understand what he meant by those things. Yeah. So you had to integrate what you were observing yourself and mm. adapt it to your own understanding. Exactly. Because it seemed what he was doing was really random. 
But once you watched him enough, you realized it was actually not random at all. He had a whole lot of tools in his toolbox. Yep. And he just didn't throw all the tools at the horse at once. He pulled out the tool he needed. Right. First. And, and, and it's, it's, as an example, the horse that I took to this workshop was extremely shy around the head. And you couldn't, you couldn't touch his ears. Now, I never said anything to that guy before I handed him the horse in the middle of the arena. Within 10 minutes, he was leading my horse around the arena by the ears. Wow. And I said, gosh, how does that work? <laughs> or something along those lines. <laughs> so um, he was listening to the horse. It, wasn't, it definitely wasn't paint by numbers. Yeah, and so... Um, you mentioned the word random because I remember when we first met sort of nearly 11 years ago or so, the, um, using horses as facilitators to, to actually learn about ourselves was um, very random then, but yeah. um, more and more so it is being embraced as um, a very powerful way to um, shift, um, for want of a better word, shift. And I mean, we've worked with a number of clients and I know you do and realizing that it's not actually um, any technique, it's the process, the process. Um, yeah. that's amazing. And Is there any particular the client that you have come across that actually was a real wow for you in your work? Oh. There's, been, there's been many moments many moments and then if, if I started telling stories in this interview will go on for several <laughs> moments and, um, but it's it's I think to sum it all up is that the, it's actually more than the process for me as a facilitator it's about trusting the process right and it's not necessarily um, the, the client doesn't necessarily get that light bulb moment in them in, while they're there. Yeah. You know, it comes a little bit later on and, and it always happens. It always comes. So it's, it's just a matter of trusting the process. You know, and it's if, what I've found, if, if, if the client can come up with their own words, their own thinking about it, that is extremely powerful. And well, I know from working with you that you are extremely good at facilitating that um, and actually posing an observation onto somebody who is working with you, uh, which enables them to um, find the words for themselves. Yeah. So it's, um, I, th I think, and over the years of developing that, it, it's what I realized is that if we bring it back to the horses, because I like to always bring it back to the horses, and it's um, the. It's a facilitation process of becoming, being able to do things with horses anyway. And it's, and it's helping the horses to learn rather than going to teach them or train them. And that's really, it's just as powerful method for working with horses as it is for working with people. And I think that's where we kind of, we separate a little bit from the, from the traditional horse world the training world is that we we facilitate a process within our horses and it's the horses and it's through the horses helping people that we kind of brought that came back to the horses again um it's like well why don't we facilitate their process as well rather than set out to be really focused on the goal and the and it's a straight line to, for the horse to get to that goal but just like us it's it's a it's a windy little path that we can we can learn through the consequences of our actions or inactions, out the consequences of our decisions, and and I don't have to be a consequence giver or a teacher, if you like. I might set some boundaries around safety, and I do that. We do that around our clients as well. That we want we want them to survive the the session, just like we want our horses to survive. It's not a good look with blood on the, on the shirt, is it? No, no, not, not at all. So it's, it's, um, but it's the same, same with the horses. But the, what the horses do, what they bring to this dynamic is an ability to remove the comfort zone. Remove wow. the comfort zone. So they push the limits, the bounds of the comfort zone. And then at that boundary of the comfort zone, there's the possibility to learn something. And if it's facilitated in a way that is, is not 
endangering either the horse or the or the human then there's, there's there is an opportunity to learn because when you're in your comfort zone let's face it you don't have to change anything right yeah yeah and so many people like if i go and train my horse that means what i'm saying is i'm trying to change my horse yep in actual fact if you want a healthy relationship the only one that you can change directly is yourself absolutely and then the other gets a, ho a choice on how to interact respond. with you yep. respond to that that different you yes when it comes to people that are solving problems in their own life they can use the horse as a mentor if you like they can test out strategies yeah and, and the horses will um help them in, in in real time they give them real time feedback and say well you know is that working out for you yep what could you do different if it's not working out you know some people get stuck in the same pattern doing the same thing over and over right. expecting the different result but the horse yeah, i've seen that many times with some of the work that we've done and also the, one of the big things for me was like and um, unlike us humans horses have no agenda yeah yep it's 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 clean it's the the intention is clean that they and in the moment yeah but they at the same time they're just like us you know they they're a product of their experience that's based around the nature that they were born with the character that they were born with so we are too so it's i know working with you it's um that I didn't like to hear the diagnosis or yep. someone was bringing with them mm -hmm. you know, if you like, yes. because I, I wanted to meet someone in the moment. Yep. Yep. And I've experienced that when I'm working with people and their horses, they, they give me a big long list about what their horse is like, or they want to tell me the big story. And I, it's really quite frankly, I'm not interested. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that um, I remember from some of our work early days with them, um, child youth and family, you know, they give me all these, background notes and I would uh, make a point of uh, not reading them because as you say, it's all about learning in that moment. Yeah. Um, I do remember one session we had with um, a gang leader mm -hmm. and the gang leader comes with its own perceptions, whether you know them or not. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember they're, um, they're always on their guard and I remember walking into the field and he had a fear of being attacked and was on his guard and there was about 20 horses in that field and we walked to the middle mm -hmm. and every single horse, they kind of formed a circle around him and they're right around the outskirts of that um, field and they mm -hmm. all turned his back, their backs on him. It yep. was just profound. It was. <laughs> It was, yeah, it was, I remember that session. There was a, a lot of um, things came up for him. In, in and the... for me, it's actually, you know, we can do all this talky talky stuff, but actually it's the experiential side of things. And because you are, he was, um, had lived in a gang environment his entire life. He was physically, mentally and emotionally exhausted, but he didn't know anything else. And he never had the freedom to, find out something else or understand things from a different perspective. And so his expectation of being attacked, he experienced in real time um, what it was not to be. Yeah, exactly. Mm. exactly. Yep. So what are some of the, um, the painful things that you've experienced over the years to get to what you're understanding now? And in that pain, are you, do you like humans anymore? <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think i think probably the biggest impact by the in if we look about the pain and the hardship was it was probably financially it was yeah. was really difficult to be able to do enough to keep the ball rolling yeah and in the, in the very early days um of the horse business and, and getting it up and running it i was um, going off, getting up at four o'clock in the morning and going milking other people's cows to earn a, bit of, a few dollars. And then um, again in the evening and, yeah, it was, and then working with the horses all day. Um, it was just doing the hard yards. It, it, it became very exhausting. Um, so what was it inside you that um, helped you to persevere? I think there was a belief that... that it could be successful and I and because I did it and I looked at, at other horse businesses 
um, horse trekking businesses before I started. And what I realized is that um, they were horse people running horse businesses. Yeah. And I, I realized that they were actually people businesses. It was about people, not horses. Right. And so you had to relate to people and people had these expectations. Oh, you go, go riding at a, a riding center and the, you can't get the horses to leave home and then you can't stop them on the way home. And um, that, you know, the, you'll have a sore butt at the end of the ride. <laughs> um, yeah, probably fall off. And, and so really, I, coming from the outside of the horse world, I was able to structure and, and find a way that people were pleasantly surprised that their, their expectations or those negative expectations weren't actually met. And, um, yeah, so because we had the focus on people. And, Did you um, find the horses helped you relate to the people better? Absolutely. It's actually someone said to me, we were kind of talking about this change in, in me over the years from being really timid around people, fearful of people. And it seemed that when I started the horse riding business is that I put the, I put the hat and the jacket on of the ultimate horse trek guide and it was kind of playing a role. And, but over the years of doing it, many, many <laughs> doing it, um, the hat and the jacket started to fit. Right. And um, it, it was, um, and I became kind of the king of my castle here, of my domain, and I could talk to anybody about anything and felt really okay about it. But when I left the farm, well, I was the guy sitting in the corner with the beer, not talking to anybody, unless they came and spoke to me. So still quite introverted when I left the safety of my domain. Right, and, right. But, but I realised that that had to change because we were, I was getting to a place where I knew that I had a message that I wanted to share wider uh, to a wider, you know, we were working with three and a half thousand people a year on the farm with the writing, but it was, it wasn't satisfying, it was satisfying, but it wasn't enough. So I, so it then I had was something bigger. Yeah. So the next st stage was being able to go off the farm and carry this, feel secure within myself. Yeah, so, so the first part of that was like, I've got to do some public speaking. Right. And that was, you know, if in, in those situations where I had to speak in public off the farm, you know, if someone, someone asked me my name, I couldn't tell them because um, the brain was wiped completely clean. I was so much in my fear. So I went to Toastmasters. Right. Did not help one little bit. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until a... A visiting US therapist and I, well, it was actually at the workshop that, that you came to mm -hmm. that first time that we met. That was kind of the, it was still on, on the farm here, but it was her that said to me, oh, after experiencing what we we're doing here, oh, you've got to come to the US and present with me at a conference. Right. And I said, oh, okay. And your heart left your mouth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that was, it was six months in six months' time, and it seemed quite safe to say okay at that point. But the closer it got, it became um, you know, a little bit more frightening. And so, so in the experience, how was it? The experience was absolutely amazing. Terrifying, but um, the roller coaster ride, because it was in Las Vegas. Right. We entered in front of 500 people, and um, yeah, the, the building that we're in had a roller coaster around the outside. So we decided that if we survived the the uh, the conference or the presentation, um, we would take a roller coaster ride. And, and it turned out the roller coaster ride. Was, yeah, with the roller coaster ride was far more terrifying than, <laughs> than present. Excellent. Yeah. So the next the next year, I put forward an idea for a presentation at the same conference um, to do on my own, and. They said yes, <laughs> which was kind of like, oh, what have I done now? Another so, big step. What's that? Another big step. Another big step, you know. And um, so I went to Salt Lake City and um, presented in a classroom, no horses in sight, in front of about 150 people. And how was that not having a horse nearby? Oh, that was kind of, um, yeah, different. Yeah. 
but it did. What I found is that I couldn't have notes, and that's kind of scary. I actually went into that. It was a one and a half hour presentation, and I had a, had a piece of paper with me. Yeah. Um, with the title, the topic that I was talking about, and otherwise everything else was blank. And managed to speak for one and a half hours. Yeah, well, knowing you as I do, um, you are a man who talks from the heart. And the um, hat and the coat that you're talking about, it's very much a part of you. It is um, under your skin. It's your natural skin. And so it's, it's no wonder. So once you get on, on um, a roll, so to speak, and, and talk, um, people are, you intrigue people because you have got a different um, approach to life. And it actually makes sense now. And I think um, when you believe something, you do it anyway. Mm. And, you know, um, but it is really hard if you've had experience of people not feeling significant yourself or being shy or whatever. Um, but as you say, your horses have been great facilitators to you. So what's the pleasure that you have gained off the back of your perseverance? Um, I think it, it's the pleasure is and it's it's to see someone grow. Right. I, it's, that is is worth more than all the gold in the world to see someone grow and and start to live um, their life a little bit more full. And. It, Talking of living full on on purpose, which is the the, the purpose behind the, the interview, is to encourage other people. What what is your understanding of the word purpose? My understanding of the word purpose. What's your interpretation? Because for me, words have their own energy, and it depends on the context. So, what is what is your understanding? What meaning do you put? Well, to if, I, if I take it personally, what my purpose is. In, a, in the big picture is to help make the world a, li a little bit better place to live in. And so by helping people to grow, that that's, um, facilitates that process. Mm -hmm. mm. And so, you do it naturally. Sorry? You do it naturally because it's a part of you, but you do it in the, in the, the best classroom of all, which is outdoors. Well, for the majority of the time, I know you work in arenas and things, but I mean, um, just in the concept of it, it is in the outdoors, you're not confined to a classroom. Yeah, but it's, it's the lessons. Nature, nature has all the lessons, mm -hmm. whether it be in the, in the environment or the animals within the environment, and, and it's the interaction of those things. Um, and if we, we just need to slow down a little bit and listen and, and, and we can find the answers in that, find the balance. You so know. you say nature's got the lessons, is there anything that springs to mind that you can refer to? Oh, it's, nature always finds the balance. Every time I look out the back door of our house, I, I look at the hills with the bush covered hills and... Um, you know, I know that 80 years ago, they stopped farming that. Back in the early 1800s, all the bush was burnt so they could farm it. Right. When the depression hit, it, it was uneconomic to farm it. And, and so they didn't farm it. And what happens? The trees come back. The bush starts to come back. So nature always finds the balance, despite what we do. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, so being in the moment, I'm just referring to my, I mean, I know it's not somewhere that everybody gets the opportunity to go to being, but being in Antarctica where there's no subliminal noise and it is pure nature at its best. And that interaction, I had an interaction with a penguin that actually came right up to me. And although it was only 30 seconds when I, he had a beeline for me and I can talk penguin now because he came up to me and with a purpose to talk to me and I talked back and there was that one moment of real understanding. There was absolutely no difference between me and the penguin. We were just different forms, but we were both just energetic beings with an understanding and we could relate to where we were. And being down in the Antarctic, it was really profound so far as being in the moment and slowing down. I found it so hard six weeks later 
I just about recalibrated coming back to the so-called normal world and um, where it is so fast paced. And I think that's the beauty of your work is actually it is everything is in the moment. Mm. Yeah, I think that's because the, the moment is, is the place to be because it's the place where you're free of fear. It's the only, only place that you're free of fear when you're present in any given moment. How and that's fearful because that's the moment you have to act. You can't react. You can't, can't anticipate. You act. But can you not be fearful in that moment? Oh, it is, it is a fear, the most fearful place to be because you have to act. Most people are, live their life reacting or anticipating. Yeah. Yes. And so to truly be present, you, you become free of fear. You become at one with everything around you, whether that be a horse, whether that be the nature, whatever. It, it, it's quiet. It, it's, it's, it's the best feeling in the world. And I have that from time to time. Yes, you sound really <laughs> excited. <laughs> just, yeah, just every now and again, I have a moment of it. Yep. And, and, and the journey really is to kind of make the space between those moments shorter and make in the other at the same time getting the moments longer yeah so do you have any tips for people who don't have a horse that that, that what they can do to help themselves because i know you've done some work with out horses that you use the same kind of principles oh that's a good question I don't know. It's it's. it's <laughs> You're sounding like a horse now. <laughs> I know. I know. When I'm having trouble relating to a person, I always think, okay, if this person was a horse, how would you relate to them? Right. Yeah. So, but people are far more complicated than than horses. Horses are really simple yes. creatures to understand, if you like, because they're so straightforward and honest. Um, oh. So it's getting out of the head. It's getting out of the head. It's, it's sometimes we have to become a little bit more aware of our of, of the words we use. Right. Um, and and I know that people have rung me up from time to time because they've got a, a problem horse, and I listen to them on the telephone, um, them describing the problem, and and I find there's one or two words that express an attitude that they have towards the horse or to the problem, and so what I've tended to do is reflect on those words. Yeah and help them to find another word or another attitude that will express a different attitude. And I never hear from them again because <laughs> it seems that they change their attitude and then suddenly the horse, the problem's gone, the problem that I had with the horse. Either that or they think I'm talking a load of rubbish and they go and find a trainer that will come and actually... <laughs> yes, someone yeah. that will beat the horse into submission yeah, sort of thing. The other methods that people want. Yeah. So um, it's yeah. I think I think it's just a it's a process of self awareness. And you use the word reflect there, which I know that's what is the horses do. And when you have the words and things, and actually whatever comes up for us is a reflection of what we have a need for ourselves. Hey. Yeah, for sure. And it's 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 always a reflective process. It's um. So there's I actually a friend of mine asked me a question once. When I was in one of those moments that was the life was a little bit too hard and and you know I actually hated her for asking the question and she became an ex friend for a while right and the Are question you friends was, again now was, yeah 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 it's um the the question was um what are you doing to create this in your life and um, yeah, it's, it's a tough question to, to listen to, to have asked. When you want a bit of sympathy and yeah. someone asks you that, it's, you know, you don't, yeah. You scrub That's the, to me like a really good friend. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And looking back on that moment, and it was, it was so hard in that moment. So, but um, it's, it, it took three or four months for me to really understand what she meant by that. It wasn't personal. Yeah. And I think that is a big, big issue, isn't it? It is the personal side of things when we take things personally. Mm, yeah, and then so it was, it was a very helpful question. And from time to time, I that question pops out of my mouth. I've heard it one or two times. Yes. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Hmm. It's, it's so, him. what could you do now to create what you want? Um, do you have any visions for where you want to go? 
um, you want to do extend your work i i just want to get get better at what i'm doing really and um it's it's we we work a lot with horse people yeah but you call them work humans um, don't you that's right so what we do in the horse world we, we say people say well what do you do and it took a long time to come up with the one sentence that we can now put it into it's it's it, that uh, we help human or help people become better humans for their horse awesome. um yeah so what the what we want to do now is is to, to not just work with horse people we want to extend that more um to the wider population doing more therapeutic work, more self-learning, self-awareness, team building, that sort of work. And, and that works relatively difficult to come by here in New Zealand. It's, it's, it's more free-flowing overseas. And so we want to um, yeah, yeah, come, out, yeah, come out more with that. And I know you are involved with um, uh, an, um, an organisation of putting a film together um, about the work that they've been doing with um, post-traumatic stress disorder with soldiers. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, there's in, in um, Germany, there's um, one of our, well, she's a client, she's a mentor, she's a friend. Um, um, she's been working a lot with the, the returning soldiers from... Um, Iraq and Afghanistan and and working with the, the post-traumatic stress syndrome using um, yeah using a variety of techniques if you like to bring these and I've, I've, I've worked with one or two of the clients and um, and and seen her working and it's it's really dramatic the the, the results that she's getting the the to help these soldiers um, reintegrate back into the into the civilization again if you like or the, the german living again so, so how have the horses helped them and what sort of can you give us an example really reflective i, I watched a two and a half hour raw cut don, documentary about one client's interaction with horses over several weeks and it was just one of the most touching things to see the the evolution of this guy and um how the various things this little quiet pony put him into this the death zone basically in his yeah. mind yeah and the 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 culmination of that movie it ended with um him lying down on the ground with the pony lying down beside him <gasps> how moving yeah, it was just really dramatic really dramatic but the the journey to get to that point was um yeah very interesting yeah and very personal and i every interaction with um every human and every horse is different yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's, yeah, it's 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 interesting like i think horses can as a, as a whole as a as a we're re as a species and, and we're really lucky that we have a big herd of them and so we can really watch this interaction and and what we've found is that horses definitely have a different way of living together in community in their herd than we do as human beings and um, it's a lot of people look at a herd of horses and think there's a hierarchy from top to bottom for example yeah um, and we live in that structure ourselves in, in a high, very hierarchical power driven um, society and, but when we start, we put away that filter of hierarchy and start really looking, we see actually there's not a hierarchy within the herd. It's the herds have, all have a different role. The horses in the herd have, a, have different roles and all the roles lead to the survival of the herd into the future. And so it's, and, and the roles that different horses have are based on their individual strengths. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's basically based, it's, it's, uh, it's not power based. It's not power based. It's equality based mm -hmm. leadership through equality um, rather than power. And so, and I hear a lot of horse people say, "Well, you know, I want to have a partnership with my horse," and yet they're looking and thinking in hierarchical terms. You cannot have a partnership if you're working in hierarchy because what you're saying there is, "I want equality, but I'm going to be a little bit more equal than my horse." <laughs> yes. wasn't there a famous author that wrote something like that 
<laughs> <Which> <laughs> well, well, everyone is equal, but some people are more equal than others. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's something that we see a lot, so we have to come to this point. Um, equality is really, it's, it's, it's a really difficult place to come to. And I guess from what you're saying earlier as well, it's um, being the shy young boy that you were um, and feeling kind of less than, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth here, it's for you now having worked with the horses and the lessons you've learned, it's, it's actually you are equal to everybody else. Has that helped you in your everyday life? Yeah, it, it, um, well, still I'm human, you know, and it's... It, it, it is hard sometimes, you know, things do annoy me and people do annoy me from time to time. And sometimes it's hard not to buy into that um, <laughs> annoyance. But one of the, I, I see it a lot within the world that we work in is that because I'm a horse trainer, people look at me as a horse trainer and, and clients tend to put me on a pedestal. I was going to say, look up to you. Yeah, and I ha absolutely hate it. Right. I really, really hate it. Because they're, they're not put, only putting me up there, they're putting themselves down there. And I can kind of relate to that because I used to put myself down there a lot. But then I go and see a lot of trainers out there that put themselves on the pedestal and yeah. talk down to their clients, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is it's not good. And then I see a lot of clients that are afraid of the trainer, which is really sad. Yes. Because it's um, I've even had people say... Um, Oh, I'm going to come and do a lesson with you when I get good enough. <laughs> it's, like, oh, it's a bit like cleaning your house before the cleaner comes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you, you don't want them to think anything ill of you. Exactly. Yeah, so I kind of find it bad that 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 happens. So um, it's it's um, yeah, it's, it's a tough place to come to. That mm -hmm. you just you're just everybody's equal. Nobody's more equal. Than you. Absolutely, absolutely. So knowing what you know now, mm. what would advice would you give your younger self if you could um, to help you not go through the pain that you've experienced to get to where you are? About about life, okay, um, and living. You know, if every, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Right. Yeah. So it allowed. You know, life, living life is, is relatively simple. Yeah. But it's not, it's not easy because you're continually having to face your fears and deal with them. Yeah. So. Awesome. Fantastic. Go well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks yeah. very much, Ian. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I know we can talk for hours and hours and hours. But um, so if anybody, you are the most human person that I've ever come across because you're very grounded, very funny. Um, and so I'm, I'm really glad that I've had the pleasure of um, calling you my friend um, and the fact that you only live around the corner. <laughs> the feeling's mutual. No, much love. Take yeah. care. Okay, Bye. thank you. Bye.